The court of public opinion turned on quad-core CPUs pretty quickly. In mid-2015, a four-core, eight-thread CPU like the i7-6700K was the sensible choice for gaming, and six- and eight-core CPUs were a waste of money. By 2017, Intel were being cussed out for the lazy stopgap of the 7700K, and the Ryzen 5 1400 was hardly talked about at all. If you're still holding on to a quad in this era of mainstream 6 cores, can it keep up? If you're in the market for a cheap CPU for a budget build, should you buy one? In my opinion, there are three perfectly valid use cases for multi-threaded quad cores in the 2020s, and I'm going to look at two of them today. Firstly, you have an old gaming rig from circa 2015, and are thinking of making some upgrades to play the latest demanding and or unoptimised titles. Secondly, you're putting together a gaming system from secondhand parts, and the cost of an i5-13600K is more than your total PC budget. Representing the first case, I have the i7-6700K, the flagship desktop i7 from 2015 on the 14nm Skylake architecture. It's paired up with 32 gigs of Dominator Platinum borrowed from my personal rig. I foolishly thought it might clock a little higher than my usual cheap stuff. Alas, the 6700K could only run it at a maximum of 3333 CL15. The CPU itself is running at 4.5GHz and is being kept cool under a Zalman tower cooler. An AIO might allow for higher clocks than this, but I think 4.5 is a pretty representative frequency for an 8-year-old CPU. For comparison, I have the benchmark data from the i7-8700K, the late 2017 6-core on the same socket. Technically, owners of 6700Ks would have had 100 and 200 series motherboards, and would need to swap that board out to support the 8000 and 9000 series CPUs. However, there is a mod referred to as Coffee Time that should allow some Skylake and Kaby Lake motherboards to run Coffee Lake CPUs, so this is possibly an upgrade path for someone with a 2015 or 2016 era Intel PC, and who isn't afraid to poke around in the BIOS. For the second scenario, I have the Ryzen 3 3100, a Zen 2 based entry level chip from AMD that launched at just $100 in 2020. I'm using the same DOM Plat kit, this time running at 3600CL16, and once more, the CPU is running at 4.5GHz under air, this time a Vitru V5, though I replaced the noisy stock fan with an old Alpenfoon one. The point of comparison for this CPU is the Ryzen 5 5600X, which at £135 is a bit of a bargain for AM4 owners, but is being compared to a quad core that can be picked up for just 40 quid. All four CPUs have been tested with the AMD RX 6900 XT to remove the GPU as a bottleneck. In the wake of the launch of Counter-Strike 2, it's arguable that Valorant isn't the most relevant of tests, but it's one that I've captured a lot of data for in the past. Being a DX11 game, it isn't terribly reliant on large numbers of cores and threads, and instead seems to like clock speeds, IPC and L3 cache. The Ryzen 3100 has a ton of L3, but is lacking a little in IPC compared to the others, and so it brings up the rear at just 267 FPS with lows of about 160. The i7-6700K just beats it at 300 FPS with lows of 177. If those i7 owners were thinking an upgrade to the 8700K would give better Valorant performance, they'd be wasting their money. The 13-ish percent boost in frame rates roughly corresponds with the 11-ish percent increase in clocks and 50% bigger L3 cache. As for the Ryzen... I don't know, man. Pretty much every Zen 3 CPU I've seen can score 500 plus FPS in this game. Raptor Lake and Zen 4 can break 600 FPS, and at this point it all seems pretty academic. Still, numbers are numbers, and the 5600X has almost twice as many as the 3100. Call of Duty Warzone is a DX12 title, and so better utilises high thread counts as a result, so the difference between 4 and 6 core CPUs is a little more pronounced. 
the Ryzen 3 hits 100 FPS on average and Swassold Nerf 1% lows, with the 6700K scoring only about 10% higher on average. The 6 cores both offer substantially higher averages from the quad cores, but not from each other. Both hit about 140 FPS with 1% lows above 100. As upgrades from the quad cores, however, they offer about 40% more on average and 50% more to minimums, and anyone in possession of a monitor with a refresh rate above 75Hz should take note. In performance mode, Fortnite is very much CPU limited, even at higher resolutions, however it is still running in DX11. It's curious then that it should show such a difference between the quad cores and 6 cores. The 8700K is over 25% faster than the 6700K, a difference which can't be purely down to the higher clock speed. The 5600X is 50% faster than the 3100, which sounds really impressive. However, I couldn't help but notice that the 1% lows across the board are almost unchanged, and anyone looking to lock their frame rate at 120 or 144 or even 165 FPS won't notice the slightest difference between any one of these CPUs. CS2 presents us with a similar scenario to Valorant, with the DX11 API limiting the appeal of higher core count CPUs. In fact, I found that disabling hyperthreading on the 8700K actually improved matters slightly. For these tests, all four CPUs have HT or SMT enabled, and the difference between the 6700K and 8700K is slim. Again, something which could be accounted for by the 500MHz higher clock speeds, with the quad core passing 210 FPS and the 6 core almost reaching 235. The Ryzen 3100 is the only chip of the bunch to fail to hit 100 FPS 1% lows. I didn't get round to checking if turning SMT off helps, but that might be worth trying if you already have a 3100 and want to play CS2. The 5600X, meanwhile, plays like a dream, with 1% lows of 144 and averages over 300 FPS. Competitive shooters like these have a different set of requirements to other types of game. In 2023, single-player titles are extremely processor-intensive, and the days of pairing a high-end GPU with a quad-core i5 are long gone. Bethesda's latest is one such example. Starfield has been shown to prefer AMD GPUs over Nvidia's, but also Intel CPUs over AMD. I guess brand loyalty ain't what it used to be. 6700K owners can expect an average of 58 FPS in demanding city areas like New Atlantis. Upgrading to the 8700K adds a healthy 10 FPS to that average, with 1% lows gaining about 12%. The Ryzen 3100, however, struggles to even reach a 50 FPS average, whereas the 5600X is roughly on par with the 8700K, meaning for over 40% better performance on average, with 1% lows that are higher than the average on the quad-core. Cyberpunk is also notoriously demanding on both CPUs and GPUs, though in a way that felt more earned. It was arguably the best-looking game of 2020 and holds up well compared to games like Starfield even now. It also doesn't seem to hate quad-cores, or not hyper-threaded ones at least. In rasterized performance, all four CPUs can produce a greater than 60 FPS average. The 6700K almost hits 100 FPS, while the 8700K scores almost 20% higher, though some of that is of course down to the higher overclock. The Ryzen 3 might be 25% slower than the 5600X, but that still means for an average of 85. The real benefit from the 6 cores is in the 1% lows, as both the 8700K and 5600K are capable of over 70 FPS here, as opposed to the 50-ish lows of the quad cores. Ray tracing in Cyberpunk is harder for me to measure since I switched to AMD, and arguably both the 6 cores are still being at least partially GPU limited, even using performance upscaling but there's still a benefit to be seen in them over the quad cores. Over 20% in the case of the Intel, and over 30% for the Ryzen. Oh, and if you're curious, I also tried the 5600X with ultra performance at 900p, for an internal resolution of just 533x300, which got GPU utilization down to between 50 and 70%, but the frame rate was essentially unaffected. The difference is similar in The Last of Us, in fact, it's possibly even a little more pronounced. 
Despite the fact that I'm walking through the woods with nothing going on, all four CPUs are nearly maxed out. Both quad cores are capable of driving a 60 plus experience, but neither is particularly smooth. 1% lows on the Ryzen are just 49 and 44 on the i7. Upgrading to the 8700K could give a not quite perfect 60 FPS, but it seems clear that newer architectures have an advantage in this game. The 5600X might be only a few frames better on average, but the 0.1% lows are miles ahead of the older chip. Jedi Survivor is... Well, there's no dressing it up. Sometimes it's arguable whether a game is truly demanding on hardware, or whether the dev team just didn't spend enough time on the PC port. Jedi Survivor is, sadly, a case of the latter, as not one of these CPUs can give a smooth experience. The frame time looks like a Californian seismograph across the board, and while the quad cores can apparently give a nice healthy 70 or 80 plus average, even close to 90 sometimes, the 1% and 0.1% lows suggest you might be better off locking at 30. Even the 6 cores can drop into the 30s despite having averages of 100 or more. Maybe I'm missing something, maybe there's a setting or hardware configuration that needs adjusting to make this actually run smooth, but it certainly looks like you're only intended to play this game with the very latest and greatest CPUs. You can play Flight Sim quite well on a quad-core i5 from a decade ago, as the engine will intelligently drop levels of detail to make it run faster, at the expense of a lot of image quality. The 4-core 8 thread chips, however, are all capable of running Flight Sim without obvious LOD trickery, and so the frame rate scales as you'd expect. The 6700K falls a little short of 60fps on average, and upgrading to the 8700K can almost reach 70fps. On the Ryzen front, the 3100 is only managing 52 FPS, whereas the 5600X scores 75. Not one of these CPUs delivers a flat frame time graph, however, as 1% and 0.1% lows are in the 20s and 30s across the board. Although, arguably, Flight Sim doesn't really rely on such metrics, at least for casual flyers. I hope strategy fans will forgive me. I don't own any recent Total Wars, I refuse to put the money into all the DLC for City Skylines, so the only strategy game I have that puts out a nice convenient benchmark number is Civ 6. The AI turn time benchmark shows only a 0.52 second difference between the slowest and fastest CPU here, and while I'm sure that all adds up over time, it feels like a stretch to expect someone to spend potentially 100 quid or more for such small gains. For this season of CPU reviews, I've decided to throw in a couple of productivity benchmarks for the sake of comparison. However, I'm starting to question their usefulness. The Blender Classroom test renders in 12 minutes 40 seconds on the Ryzen 3, and 14 minutes 15 seconds on the i7-6700K. Upgrading to the 6 core options for each socket, sees times drop to 8 minutes 10 and 10 minutes 2 respectively. However, I'm no Blender expert, but I guess if you had an Nvidia GPU you'd probably just use CUDA and get faster times anyway. Blender users, let me know if I'm chatting bullshit. Now I know this one's dumb. DaVinci Resolve Studio completes a 5 minute 4K H.264 render in an agonising 27 minutes 42 seconds on the quad core i7. The Ryzen 3 is a little faster at 24 minutes, but still ridiculously slow. The 6 cores drop those render times to over 18 minutes on the i7 and 16 minutes on the Ryzen, and that's really impressive. But using the RX 6900 XT would render this even faster and produce a much smaller file, and you could render in H.265 instead. Can someone please come up with a better productivity benchmark for CPUs? Preferably one that doesn't cost hundreds or require a subscription. Thanks. Anyway, before I wrap up, I wanted to answer a question that a lot of people ask in the comments, but usually in a more accusatory tone. I'm testing these CPUs with a pretty high-end Radeon GPU that might not make sense to pair with a £40 Ryzen 3 or an 8-year-old i7. What would a more sensible graphics card option be? In truth, it's probably higher end than you'd expect. The problem I have answering that question myself is that I tend to review mostly cheaper second-hand GPUs, so my database of graphics card results doesn't cover much higher than a GTX 1080 Ti. 
Instead, I've spent a little time browsing around, cross-referencing my CPU results, more specifically those from the 6700K, with GPU reviews from around the internet. For each game, I've come up with four GPU recommendations, one which matches the average FPS the CPU can achieve, and one which matches the 1% lows. Matching the average FPS will still see those drops when the CPU can't keep up, so aiming to match the 1% low might be a little more practical, and probably a bit cheaper too. Oh, and I've chosen one each from AMD and Nvidia, because I know some of you just refuse to buy one brand or another. The competitive shooters, Valorant, Warzone, Fortnite and CS2, warranted a little extra testing. As these are games you're most likely going to want to play on lowest settings, there's not a whole lot of data out there. I happen to have an RX 6600 on hand for review, coming soon, and as it's one of the best value options under £200 brand new and under £150 used, it seems like a pretty good candidate for esports gamers. Paired with a Ryzen 5600X, it was capable of 427 FPS on average in Valorant and 242 1% lows. Not quite as high as the 6900XT managed, but still more than enough to be bottlenecked by either the 6700K or Ryzen 3100. The margin is a little narrower in Warzone at about 10%, but still definitely more than enough to saturate the quad cores. Fortnite was a bit iffy at the low end, the averages are about as expected, but there were a fair number of stutters. Finally, CS2 at 1440 low scored about 5% less on average than the 6900 XT did on the same CPU, but that seems like fairly standard run-to-run -run variants. If anything, the 6600 might even be a bit overkill for these quad cores, and should still give you room to turn up a few graphics settings. The question at the top of the video was, are quad cores extinct? The answer is, well, no, not yet. There are a few qualifiers and exceptions, however, like any Intel from before Haswell lacks AVX2 support, and any Ryzen from pre-Zen 2 will underperform in AVX workloads. Quad cores without hyperthreading, like older i5s and the Ryzen 3200G, really are past their prime, especially in DX12 and Vulkan. Finally, all signs are pointing to a world where games are only going to get more demanding and or less well optimised for PC, so even if the games you want to play now do just fine on a quad core, that might not hold true for the next game. There are, in my opinion, three valid reasons to look at quad cores for gaming in 2023, but in this video I've only looked at the first two, the third is buying a new one. The AM4 socket may be dead from a development standpoint, but it's still alive and well at retail, and there's a single quad core in the Zen 3 lineup, the Ryzen 3 5300G APU. I don't currently have one of these to test, but if there's enough interest in a follow up video, I could perhaps be persuaded to buy one. Meanwhile, there are still places stocking some of the 10th gen Intel i3s, which were the only hyper threaded quad cores on the LGA 1200 socket. I also don't have a 1200 motherboard right now, and I don't really see myself investing in one anytime soon. The 10th gen is, in my opinion, a bit of a dead loss. It lacks Gen 4 PCI Express, and its upgrade path is narrower and offers poorer value than AM4. While AMD doesn't have a quad core on the AM5 platform at the moment, Intel still produces the i3-13100 on the Raptor Lake architecture, so the practice of manufacturing quad cores is clearly not dead yet. As for how they compare in modern gaming, that'll have to wait for another video, maybe once my wallet's recovered from 2023. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.